For those of you who just joined, we're about to get started in just another minute. Great, okay. It's 7.02 now, we have 90 participants. I'm sure more will join over the next few minutes. But uh, I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Nick Komar. I'm the president of Colorado Field Ornithologists. Welcome everybody to the next iteration of the Birding Skills Workshop Series. And tonight we have, we're very happy to have with us Andy Bankert to talk about sparrow identification. Andy is a young birder who's a, who grew up in Florida and then also spent time in New Mexico and then moved to Colorado where he was studying, getting his advanced degree at Colorado State University and now lives in Alaska, but he's an expert on all birds. And he was very kind to, to agree to offer this workshop on sparrow identification. Sparrows are, are that one of those groups of birds that are, are hardest to identify and give people fits during fall migration when they come through Colorado. So hopefully uh, what he presents tonight will help us in improving our birding skills. <clears throat> I might also mention that uh, he's gonna be in Colorado next weekend. And he's offered to lead a sparrow identification field trip um, that uh, limited to 10 people. It's, there's three spots left in the, on the field trip. Um, so um, if you like what you hear tonight and you want to join the field trip, go ahead and visit our website, cobirds.org. Uh, go to, go to uh, upcoming events and you'll find how to join the field trip if there's still space available. Okay, so I'm still letting people in here. And now there's 93 participants and I think we can probably get started. So Andy, I will, uh, I, let me make sure that, um, that your screen is being shared right now. I'll just mention that um, we're not gonna have people interrupt Andy during, during the presentation, but if you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can type your question into the chat box and I might be, and I'll probably uh, transmit your question, or there'll be a period at the end of the presentation when people can ask questions themselves. So with that, um, Andy, uh, you can go ahead and get started. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody tonight um, to the talk on sparrow identification. Um, hold on, I say my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully, it works okay. Um, yeah, so as many of you guys know, this is one of the most challenging groups of birds to identify, and I even struggle um, with some of these identifications sometimes, especially uh, now that I've moved up to Alaska, where we don't have a ton of diversity. So it's really nice to go back and revisit how to identify some of these birds and some of these birds that I haven't seen for a year or two uh, because I've been out of the state and out of, out of the lower 48. So... Um, hopefully, we all come out of this learning a little bit more than we knew already knew about sparrow identification. Some, some of you guys might be just starting out and hey, Andy, let me, know what a Andy. sparrow is, and some people might have seen a lot of these species, but maybe not. Um, but yeah. Andy, let me suggest that you close, yeah, can you close out your uh, video so that that'll make it a little easier to deal with the internet problems? There Does that go. work? Yeah, I think that might be better. Awesome, cool. Yeah, so hopefully, hopefully, you come out of tonight learning something. Whether whether sparrows are very new for you, or if you've seen a lot of these species but might have trouble identifying them because somebody else pointed them out, or you've identified them a couple times before, <laughs> have problems when you get into a big flock of them. So, all right, there we go. Um, so first off, what are sparrows? Sparrows are a group of birds that we call a lot of the smaller and brown brown songbirds. Uh, they used to be in the family Emberizidae, but I think they've changed that recently. Um, and there's a couple there's a couple birds in that are lumped in with the sparrows that don't have sparrow in the name, especially birds like towhees, which are considered sparrows. And our, our state bird, the lark bunting, is considered a sparrow, even though it doesn't have the word sparrow in its name. And we also have the house sparrow, which is an old world sparrow, which isn't lumped into this group, actually, and does cause a lot of people problems because they look through the field guides and look for sparrows. And the bird they're looking at is actually an old world sparrow, not, not a new world sparrow, which is 
what this that used to be called Emberizidae. And unlike birds like warblers or or tanagers, they're they're not brightly colored. They're usually pretty dull colored. Usually some version of gray or white on the chest and brown or reddish on the back. And that's that's what you see with a lot of sparrows, which makes them really challenging to identify. And even though they don't change plumages that drastically like our warblers do, um, sometimes some subtle changes in plumage variation can be a little confusing. Um, and luckily for us, unlike, unlike warblers, which leave the state, uh, sparrows are in Colorado year round. We have a different mix throughout the different seasons, but uh, you can go out almost any time of year and find a sparrow somewhere, somewhere in the state. And I think there've been uh, 32 species that have been seen in Colorado and about 26 of them are regular, depending on how you define regular. Um, and when we're identifying sparrows, instead of starting off with 32 or 26 uh, possible choices, it's really, it's really nice to try to narrow that down a little bit because if you have to look through 26 birds and look for finer identification tips versus five or six, then that's gonna be a lot easier. So the first two steps I would take or the to, to narrow sparrow identification down would be to know your location and date because there's some some species we have in the state like canyon towhee that only live in the desert areas and some species like the white-throated sparrow are only found here in the winter and you see them in spring and fall migration but they're mainly around in the winter and you're not going to see one of those in the summertime and then also another good way to to narrow sparrows down and eliminate a lot of the look-alike species is by the size and the streaking and most sparrows are about the same size they're all pretty small but if you can get a general idea of which ones are larger and which ones are smaller which mostly takes practice in the field and then also whether they're streaked on the chest or not will give you a good clue of where to start and where to start looking and then what to consider and then once we figure out these things where we are what's what season it is how whether it's a big sparrow or a smaller sparrow and whether it has streaking on the chest then we can start looking at specifics like overall color, especially the color of the chest and the back and the face. We can see some species have eye rings and some species don't. Uh, we can look at tail pattern and head pattern are a lot of times big clues to identifying sparrows. And the, the first step before we get started on all this is to make sure the bird we're looking at is actually a sparrow. There are several species in Colorado that, that look like sparrows, which actually aren't sparrows. Like we have, can you guys see my mouse? Can you see the mouse, Nick? Yes, and we can. Yep. Okay. So this piece is up here is an American pipit. It's streaked on the chest, but it has a, if you get a good look at them, they have really long tails and they kind of walk around bobbing, bobbing their heads and their tail, which is a good way to know that that's a pipit. This bird down here in the lower left is a house sparrow, which is, like I said earlier, is an old world sparrow. And they, they're not quite shaped like normal sparrows. They're a lot chunkier and very short tailed. And a lot of times in a lot of plumages, they have this yellow bill, which a couple other sparrows have. And they have this single white wing bar and they're mostly brownish overall. Um, but a lot of times house sparrows can be a little tricky to tell from normal sparrows. And they're typically concentrated around urban areas. So if you're in an urban setting and around development, then that might be a good sign to, to check out house sparrows as an option before you start looking into all the other sparrows. And then another group is the long spurs, which used to be considered relatives of sparrows, but are no longer um, due to some genetic research that's happened. And we have a couple of species, like in the lower right, we have the thick-billed long spur, and in the upper right, we have the lapland long spur, which we see in the winter. Um, and if you get a really good look at them, you can see on this lapland long spur, the back, the back toe is super long, which is how they get their name. And they can be tricky sometimes. Birds like Vesper sparrow look really similar to lapland long spurs, and not too much looks similar to the thick bill long spur in the breeding plumage, but in the winter they get brown, just like a lot of sparrows do. And if you're in Colorado in the summertime, the only long spur species we have are thick billed and chestnut collared long spur, which both have a lot of white in the tail. So if you're looking at a sparrow um, out in the grasslands and it in the summer and it flies and it has a bunch of white in the tail, it's probably a long spur, not a sparrow. And the lap of the long spur up here can be can be challenging because it does look like a lot of the sparrows. It has this tannish face and, and buffy color overall. Um, and they're really, they can be really challenging. Um, but they give a dry rattle call, which a lot of sparrows don't give any, don't give any rattling at all. And then the first step, once you, once you are pretty sure the bird you're looking at is a sparrow, 
I would start and just keep in the back of your mind where you are and what time of year is it. If you're on the grasslands in the summertime, you might you might find a grasshopper sparrow, but you probably won't find a bird like a dark-eyed junco on the grasslands in the summertime. One of the good examples of this is uh, is desert sparrows. There's a couple species which are mostly down in southeastern Colorado, which you would rarely see out of out of deserty scrub habitat or any habitat where you'd expect to find like a scrub jay or a curve-billed thrasher with, with yucca and cholla. Um, and these species are uh, canyon towhee, rufous crown sparrow, and black-throated sparrow. Um, and they're all they're all very, very rare away, away from any deserty habitats. So if you're if you're considering that as an option, make sure you know that that you should should be in a desert habitat to to really really strongly consider these. And then also there are, like I said earlier, there are some species that are only found during certain times of year, mostly in the winter. We have a couple species that are only here in the summer, um, like cassins and grasshopper and Baird sparrow. Uh, but there's a couple that are only here in the winter too, like this golden crown sparrow. Um, which shows up rarely in Colorado, maybe a couple every year, along with swamp, Harris's, white-throated, and tree sparrow, which are a little bit more regular in the winter. And especially American tree sparrow, we only see that from about maybe late September or October into, into March, and then they leave. So that's our true true winter sparrow, and the others, the others can linger into May sometimes. Um, and you can see on this golden crown sparrow, he's got a little, little bit patch of golden up here, uh, which is along with the darker colored breast is the main difference between that and the more common white ground sparrow. And then once we get down and know, like have an idea of what kind of habitat we're in and what kind of species to expect and what kind of, what time of year it is, we can start looking at the, the size of the bird and the streaking. And that's how I'm gonna group the birds tonight. This groups nicely into, instead of having 20, 20 birds to look at, we're gonna look at them in groups of like, four to six or four to eight I think and then there's also a group of unique looking sparrows which really don't look like sparrows much at all to me and that's what we're going to start with today are these unique looking sparrows the dark eye junco and the towhees and the male lark bunting um, and if you look at these you probably wouldn't think that any of these are sparrows just by just by looking at them maybe the canyon towhee in the upper right but the rest of them look pretty different and to start off with, we're going to go with probably the easiest sparrow to identify, which is the dark eye junco, um, which can be seen throughout the year in Colorado. During the summertime, the, uh, the gray headed subspecies breeds up in the mountains. And during the winter, we have, I think it's five different subspecies throughout the state, and they can be found almost anywhere. Um, the, the slate colored is probably the most common and widespread. They're, they look pretty similar to this bird in their lower right, which is a pink sided junco without without the pink on the side. So the dark eyed junco, the slate colored form, is all slaty gray on top and on the chest and just has a white belly and a lot of white in the tail. Um, the next most common typically is either the pink sided or the Oregon junco. We have a pink sided down here in Oregon up here, um, which both have this like brownish patch on the back. They have, a, they have a grayish or black face and then they have these rufous or pinkish sides. And the main difference between the pink sided and the Oregon junco is that the Oregon junco has a black hood and the pink sided doesn't have that black hood. It's its whole hood is, is gray. So if you see this really contrasty line right here between the Oregon on, on the head and the back of the Oregon junco, you can see how, how sharp this line is. And that's a good way to tell that a bird's in Oregon versus a pink sided junco, which has this fairly uniform, uniform gray color without any of these sharp contrasts except for along the sides. And then we also have the gray-headed junco, which is our local breeder, which looks pretty similar to a, to a slate colored junco or, a, or even a pink sided without, without the pink on the side, except it has a nice red spot on the back. So if you look right here on the Oregon junco, if this was a gray-headed junco, it would be a dark, a brick red spot or, or like triangular patch on the back. And it would be mostly gray throughout with a little bit of white in the belly. And then the last subspecies is the, is the white wing junco, which only, only nests in the Black Hills of the Dakotas and the Pine Ridge in Nebraska. And they winter in Colorado around six or 7,000 feet. And they pretty much look like a larger slate colored junco with two white wing bars. And, and, that's, uh, and that's the junco subspecies. But to tell a bird's a dark eye junco rather than any other sparrow, we're just going to look for this, this uniform dark color 
Um, and the white belly, you see this, there's this clean white belly here, which all the subspecies have. And I think all the subspecies that we see in Colorado have pink beaks. There is a subspecies, the gray-headed, or the red-backed junco down in, uh, down in Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico, which has, which looks really similar to the gray-headed junco, except it has a black upper mandible. So the top of the beak is black and the bottom is pink. But most of the species we see in Colorado, the beak is pink. They have no streaking on them whatsoever. They're either all gray or a mixture of the black, gray, brown, and, and, and pinkish on the sides. Another thing is they have a lot of white in the tail. You can see on the pink side down here, he has several of his outer tail feathers are white and they're folded up right now. So it looks like the tail is completely white. So that's a good way to identify a junco if you ever flush one in the forest. Um, you, you and you see a bunch of white in the tail, and you're pretty sure it's a sparrow. It's probably a dark eyed junco. And now we're going to move on to the towhees. Uh, the canyon towhee is a year round resident in the desert scrub habitat in southeastern Colorado. You can see them in spots like Pueblo and Canyon City, as well as some of the uh, canyons down in southeastern Colorado. And I, I think they're even up at Chico Basin Ranch in, in Pueblo and El Paso counties. And the, the main thing about the canyon towhees, they're pretty much just dull olivey brown color overall with a little bit of r rusty or, or reddish brown in the tail. And then a little bit of buffy in the face with a, with a buffy eye ring and a faint hit hint of a rufous cap. Um, and that's kind of similar to the, uh, to the rufous crown sparrow, which we'll cover later. But these are the things to look for. And like the other species of towhee, it has a long tail. Um, they have all these long rounded tails, which kind of differentiate most of the towhees from the other, from most of the other sparrows. And actually, I forgot to mention, we're going to play some of the calls too. So here's the, the song of the dark eyed junco, which is a kind of like dry rattle, which is fairly short. And that was the Dark Eye Junko song on the previous slide. And now if we want to hear the Ken and Toei song, we're going to play that now. So it's pretty loud and it's pretty like, pretty much like an alarm song. Almost like a Northern Cardinal if you're from the East Coast. And if you heard a song like that in the in the canyon lands of southern or southeastern Colorado, that might clue you in that you're looking for a canyon towhee. The next species is the green-tailed towhee, which is rare in the winter in Colorado, but a fairly regular breeder throughout much of the mountainous regions in the in the western two-thirds of the state or western half of the state. Um, and you can see them on the foothills in the front range where they're fairly common sometimes. And this is really the only sparrow we have in Colorado that gives us overall greenish yellow impression too. You can see it especially in the tail and the wings. And there aren't there really aren't any other sparrows in Colorado that give off that impression. But other things to look for on this is this bright, bright rusty cap. Um, they kind of have a white mustache, which is called a mallard stripe. Um, and if we got a better look, you can see that his throat is completely white. And also the the overall color in, in addition to this this yellow green is this uh, dark gray or like greenish gray color on the back and the chest. And this is the green-tailed towhee. And they give a song that's similar to other, to the spotted towhee. It's more complex than the spotted towhee and almost more like a, like a lark sparrow or something, I think. Next, one of the most common sparrows we have, especially in the foothills of Colorado, is the spotted towhee. And these birds breed throughout the foothills at, at that lower elevation, like six to 8,000 feet mostly in the, uh, in the summertime. And you can get them on either side of that elevation range. And they winter at lower elevations and they're a lot less common. They're either less common or less conspicuous. And uh, living up in Northern Colorado, when, uh, when I was living in Colorado, I, didn't, I rarely ever saw them in the winter. And I think down in the southern part of the state, they're probably more regular during the winter time. But these birds are almost abundant in some areas during the during the summer. And they have one of the most distinctive things about them is this black head and chest right here, and this 
rufous on the side. They used to be called the rufous sided towhee because they were lumped in with the eastern towhee, which we get is very rarely in Colorado out on the eastern plains. Um, but the things to look for, if you see a if you see a large sparrow like bird with this long tail that the towhees have and a dark head and this roof rufous on the sides, you're you're probably looking at a spotted towhee. And unlike the eastern towhee, which has almost a solid dark back with one one or two white wings spots in the wings, uh, the spotted towhee has all these white spots on the back, which are how we differentiate that from the eastern towhee. And then also, if you, you were to see it fan out its tail, it would be a long, a longer round dark tail with uh, with white spots in the corner. And this is the spotted towhee song. And our final distinctive sparrow is the only one that we're going to visit twice tonight because they have very different plumages, unlike most of these other birds, which have subtle differences between the male and the female. In the summer and the winter plumage, Alaric bunting has really distinctive um, plumages between the males in the summer and the and the females and also the winter males. So, uh, so the the adult male and breeding plumage is a very very distinctive sparrow, and it's just our state bird, so we're probably all fairly familiar with it or at least heard of the Alaric buntings before. Um, and they breed throughout the eastern plains in, in Colorado, and they're they're variable from year to year. So some years there'll be a lot around, and other years there won't be as many. And this has to do with the rain patterns and, and what the vegetation is doing, not only in Colorado but elsewhere. Um, if there's good vegetation further south, they might stay further south, and if there's good vegetation further north, they might go further north. And some years we get a lot of these birds. You can have hundreds of them in flocks throughout the plains in migration, and sometimes they'll stick around into the summertime. Uh, but if you ever see a black bird out on the prairie, especially in a spot like Pawnee, that's the solid black with these white wing patches, you're probably looking at a lark sparrow, or a, a lark bunting, sorry about that. Uh, we'll get to lark sparrow later. Um, but some things to keep an eye out for, because we might encounter lark sparrows at other times of year, are the fact that they have pretty short tails, and they're pretty chunky looking overall for a sparrow. And they have a thick, a pretty thick bill and a, and a large headed look. So if you see this bird, it doesn't have a small head. This guy's got a large head and a pretty thick bill on him. <clears throat> and we'll, uh, we'll show you more about what they, what they look like later uh, at other times of year and in other plumages, because they can look a lot like sparrows. It'd be kind of confusing. And now we're going to start getting into the trickier species. Um, now that we've covered the unique sparrows, hopefully those are all things that we can identify fairly easily now. Um, but then if we have a sparrow that's fairly small and doesn't have any streaking on the chest, we can assume it's maybe one of these eight species. Um, we can have the grasshopper, chipping, clay-colored brewers, field, American tree sparrow, black-throated, or swamp sparrow. So if we see a sparrow that's small and unstreaked, this, this might be our best bet uh, to look at these. If, it might be hard to judge size, so we might, we might have a white crown or a casting sparrow or also unstreaked, but they're a little bit larger than most of these sparrows. And uh, we're going to start with the grasshopper sparrow, which which is only around in Colorado in the summertime, uh, and they're mostly on the eastern plains. They're they're local in grasslands elsewhere in the state. I've I've had them up at Trapper Mine up in Moffat County before, but they're mostly in spots like out in the Pawnee or even further east. Um, and one thing to look at on the on the grasshopper sparrow is they they just give this overall buffy impression to them. So if you look at this bird um, here, he just look he looks buffy and sandy overall. Um, and every now and then you get a little bit of faint streaking on the chest, but it's usually not noticeable. And once once you see that buffy overall impression, you might think, oh, maybe a clay colored or something like that. The next thing to look for is that is this yellow patch um, in front of the eye. And most grasshopper sparrows have some sort of yellow or buffy in the face. So if you see a bird with a buffy chest and yellow in the face that's not streaked, it's probably a grasshopper sparrow. And they don't have a very patterned face. It's pretty plain aside from that yellow patch. And they do have a, a fairly thin eye ring, but it's noticeable in this picture. Um, it's not always something I look for, but it is something to keep in mind if it's if it's got an eye ring, that, that's something that a grasshopper sparrow has. And they do have fairly large bills for sparrows of their size. And because they don't migrate too far, they have fairly short tails and short wings. So these birds will come from our grasslands and head down to Mexico uh, and Arizona and Texas in the wintertime. 
And the next is going to be the chipping sparrow, which is one of our more common sparrows in Colorado. We can see them in large, large migrant flocks. Um, and they breed throughout the state in the summer, mostly up in the mountain foresty areas. And they're very rare, but, but have occurred in the winter before. And some things I look to look, like to look at for them are this, uh, are the gray chest, which is a really, really good clue that it might be, it might be a chipping sparrow. And then if you see them in flight, their rump is solid gray. We can't see it in this picture, but, um, but some of the other si similar sparrows have different, different colored rumps or different streaking pattern on the rumps. And the chipping sparrow is most similar to the clay colored and the brewer's sparrow. And one of the most solid things that separates those two um, from the chipping sparrow is they have plain lures and the lures are the area between the eye and the bill. And if you see right here, the, the chipping sparrow has this dark line between the eye and the bill and the lures. And that, that is something that the chipping sparrows have, but a lot of the similar relatives don't have. So if you see the sparrow that's small and unstreaked and has, this line, has a line through the eye that, that continues through the eye to the bill, um, that might be a good sign that that's a chipping sparrow. Um, they also have a rusty cap and breeding plumage, which gets a little duller uh, in the fall and in the winter, so that might be a little challenging. Um, but if you see if you see a bird that's again small and unstreaked in the in the summertime with a rusty cap, that might be a really good clue that you're looking at a chipping sparrow. Um, and they also have these black stripes on the back, so their their back is uh, patterned with black and brown. Some birds, especially like the towhee, or don't have this pattern on the back. And then they have two white wing bars, so you can see the wing bars right here. And these are just all other things to look for for the chipping sparrow. But for any any small unstreaked sparrow that's that's both gray gray on the chest, so you have this gray overall impression, and then has this line through the eye. Um, that's what I would look for on chipping sparrows. And here's the chipping. Oh, I forgot to do the the song of the grasshopper sparrow. So let's go back. If let's get let's get out of the forest again. Let's go back into the grasslands. And if you hear this. This has a couple like tinkly introductory notes and then a long buzz that's really thin. And if you hear that, you're probably within 100 yards of one. I think the farthest away, I, I did a lot of surveys for them up on the Soapstone Prairie in northern Larimer County. I think the farthest away I ever heard one was 125 meters. So, so if you hear that song, we'll play it again for you. If you hear that song, there's a good chance that there's a grasshopper sparrow fairly close to you. And then here's a chipping sparrow song, which sounds really similar to the junco, but it usually goes on for a little bit longer. That's a chipping sparrow. It sounds, it's a little bit less musical and typically a little bit longer than a dark eyed junco, but I've had birds up here in Alaska where they where chipping sparrows are rare, but do occur that sound really similar. And I have, I've had a hard time telling chipping sparrows from juncos sometimes just by song. So that's why I try to track them down and look for them. And they look very different. The next bird, which is similar to the chipping sparrow is a clay colored sparrow. Which we only see during migration in Colorado, so we'll only see that they're not um, they're not going to stick around and breed like the chipping of the brewer sparrow. And something that I usually cue into on for these guys is this buffy chest right here. Hold on, it says my internet is unstable. Um, we can hear you fine right now. Okay, awesome, cool. Uh, the buffy chest and then the gray the gray neck, which is also called a nape. Um, and I might use these terms interchangeably. So if I say the word nape, that means the back of the neck. Um, so you can see you can see that this is a clean gray. It's not very streaked, or I don't see any streaks on this at all. Um, and the buffy chest are typically what I get clued into and think that a bird might might have a chance of being a clay colored sparrow. It also does have this brown cap with a gray stripe in the middle, and it has kind of a plain face. You can see there's a circle and there's a line behind the eye, but Unlike the chipping sparrow, between the eye and the bill and the lures, there's no there's no dark marking, so the line doesn't continue. And that's a good sign if you're pretty sure a bird is a clay colored or a chipping sparrow. It's got buffy, but you can't tell if it's really buffy or it might just be gray. Uh, look look at this area between between the eye and the bill. 
And if there's there's no dark markings, it's probably it's probably going to be a clay colored sparrow, especially if the the neck is is pure gray. Um, and also, like like most of the other sparrows that are small, it does have some black and brown stripes along the back. And we have a bright white mallard stripe here. This little mustache thing um, right here is a good is a good way to another good thing to look for on the chipping sparrow or on the clay colored sparrow. Sorry about that. And unlike the chipping sparrow, which has a gray rump, the uh, the clay colored sparrow has a buffy rump. So these are all things to look for. Sometimes it can be really hard to tell. And typically, the clay colored, the brewers, and the chipping sparrows all occur in, in large large flocks, and they all get mixed together. So sometimes there might only be one or two clay colors in there. Um, and if you're looking for them, these might these are all good things to look for to make sure you have a solid clay color because they're typically a little bit less common than, than the chipping or the brewers, although we've had some days where this can be the most common sparrow out on the prairie. And even though they don't breed in Colorado, it is not uncommon to hear their song. So I'm going to play that song for you because they will sing on their migration. So unlike the chipping sparrow, which has this trail, this uh, the clay colored sparrow just has this very non-musical buzz to it, um, and it's non-musical. And we'll hear the next the next bird should be the brewer's sparrow, I think, or whenever we get to that, they're a little bit more musical, and I think they have a similar similar quality though sometimes. And the next is the brewer's sparrow, which is again similar to the chipping and the clay colored sparrow, um, and these guys are. Uh, can be found almost anywhere in the state. They're more common the further west you get, and they can breed in any of the sagebrush or rabbit brush patches throughout throughout a good chunk of the state. We don't get them along the front range as much. Um, nesting, a lot of times you do have to get over to the west slope to find them breeding. They do breed locally up in northern Colorado, I know. I don't know their status uh, for breeding down in south southeast eastern Colorado, but, um, <clears throat> but like the chipping sparrow, they have a gray on street chest. Um, but if you look at the neck here, unlike the chipping and the clay colored sparrow, there's some fine streaking on the on the neck, especially as you get towards the back. And the rump, which we can't see in this picture, unfortunately, has streaking, unlike the chipping and the clay colored sparrow. And the brewers has a pretty plain face um, without without any very distinctive markings. And if we look between the eye and the and the beak again in the lores, there's there's no black markings, so we can tell this isn't a chipping sparrow. Um, and sometimes uh, brewers and clay colored can be a little a little challenging. They typically do have this faint, faint eye ring, and they also have this streaking on the neck, which are which are good clues to tell that a bird's a brewer's sparrow. And they typically do have a white, a white mallard stripe, or at least a, a paler mallard stripe. It might not be as sharp as a clay colored sparrow. So typically, I think of brewers as like a more muted and less less well defined clay color. So if we go back to the clay color here, you can see this face is pretty bold. You have this the sharp contrast between the white and the black on the buffy face and this strong line behind the eye uh, without much of an eye ring. And then you go to the brewer's sparrow, the face is just kind of pretty much grayish overall uh, with that little bit of an eye ring. And these these two species can be difficult to tell sometimes if they're if it's like a brighter color brewer's sparrow, but typically the brewers are grayer and plainer and the chippings are buffier and more contrasty and stand out a little bit more. <clears throat> And the next one, oh, here, let's play the Brewer Sparrow song real quick. I'll put it up so you associate the sound with the picture. So it's very musical. It starts off with that buzziness that, that the clay color has, but more musical. And it's kind of this three-parted song. And sometimes when you're up in the sagebrush habitat, this might be one of the few birds. You might have a sage thrasher and a brewer's sparrow and maybe a sagebrush sparrow. And those will be the only birds you can hear in the sagebrush sometimes. So if you hear this musical musical song that kind of that kind of trills, uh, like a buzzy trill that's that's musical throughout the sagebrush, you're probably listening to a brewer's sparrow. And we'll get to the, the sagebrush sparrow later. And the next is the field sparrow, which is a small and unstreaked sparrow that's pretty much only in eastern Colorado, out on the eastern plains. And even there, they're fairly local, um, especially on the 
with Arkansas and even more so range before these become regular. And occasionally one will set up territory along the front range, but um, I've only had them once or twice up, up in that area. And I've had them more commonly out in the towns of Lake Ray. Um, and their chest can be a little variable. It can go anywhere from gray to this buffy color in this picture. Uh, but one thing I always look at for the chipping sparrow is this, is this white eye ring and this plain face and the deep pink bill. So if you see, if you see a bird, um, a small sparrow and you're out in Eastern Colorado and it's got this bright eye ring without, without any lines in the face, you can see the brewer sparrow here has kind of this darker, darker line coming behind the face. And you go to the, the field sparrow, it has very little pattern at all. Maybe a slight hint of rufus going behind the eye. Um, and this bright pink, pink bill, you're probably looking at a, at a field sparrow. I think about it. Let me double check. Uh, this is one of the few sparrows in this group with a small on streak that has this, that has this pink bill. So that's a really good thing to look for. If it has an eye ring and a pink bill and a small and unstreaked, you're probably looking at a field sparrow. Um, and if you're in Western Colorado or even along the front of me, you might want to try to get a picture because it's probably uncommon where you are. They also do have a, a rusty cap and a pretty weak mallard stripe here. You can see it's very faint um, that it's a different color. But again, on the field sparrow, the things I would look for are the pink bill and the plain face. It's also a lot of people typically say it's one of the cutest sparrows just because it does have that plainness on it. And here's the field sparrow song. It sounds like a bouncing ping pong ball. So it just starts off slow and accelerates and it's pretty musical. And if you're out in a spot like Ray or anywhere along the Kansas Nebraska border, you might, you might be able to hear that that sound in town somewhere. Our next one is the American tree sparrow, which is our only uh, only sparrow that's that leaves super early in the year. So if if you if you see a bird in like May or September and or May or August and think it's one of these, you, you probably want to look elsewhere. But um, these guys are around, especially throughout the middle of winter. This is when these tree sparrows are most common, and they're found pretty much throughout the state. And some things you want to look for on them are, are a gray chest and this dark spot on the chest. And also that this dark spot with the, with the plain chest, as well as this bicolored bill here, you can see that the top is black and the bottom is yellow. And these are, this is a really good sign that you're, you're looking at a tree sparrow. And I think most of the other ones, actually, yeah, most of the other small and unstreaked sparrows are out of the state by the time the chipping, or the tree sparrows arrive. So that's another good, Good clue. They, these guys typically aren't difficult to identify just because anything that looks similar is probably probably left the state when they arrive. But again, the, the gray chest with the spot and then the bicolored bill, in addition to this thin line behind the eye, they have a white wing bar here and a, and a rusty cap with a gray stripe down the middle. And next is the black-throated sparrow. This can go back and forth between a distinctive sparrow or not. Uh, but they they're pretty local in the in the desert east scrub area in uh, in western Colorado, and they're local in southeastern Colorado. I've seen them at a few spots around Canyon City, and I know they can get them down in uh, down like south of Los Animas. I think they're in those canyons down there as well. And I I'm pretty sure they are around, but they're just difficult to find in the winter time. And on the adults, you, if you see a bird that's pretty solid, uh, just like like around the bottom and darker gray on the back and has this dark black throat and this striking face pattern with the with a white eyebrow which is called a supercilium and the white mallard stripe uh, you're probably looking at a black-throated sparrow and this is another bird that's pretty easy to identify if you see them in their breeding plumage and and their adult plumage um, and, but if you see one that's not not in that plumage if you see a juvenile which a lot of the birds that turn up as vagrants are uh, they actually do look pretty similar. They are streaked, which I know this is in the unstreaked category, but uh, the adults and most of the plumages are streaked, but if the young birds are going to have streaking on them. Um, and you're actually going to see the similar face pattern. You're going to have a plain face, a very plain back. Most of the other small sparrows that we're looking at today have pretty patterned backs. Um, and then you're going to see this white throat and then the streaking on the chest. So it's the, the young, the young black-throated sparrows can be pretty challenging to tell apart sometimes they superficially look like a large bunting without a white wing patch or even a sagebrush sparrow which looks even more similar and we'll talk about those later but if you see this bright 
contrasty supercilium and mallard stripe, as well as this, this white throat. And you can tell, you can see this black border on it. So this wants to start turning black and just a plain, a plain back like the adults and a plain, uh, like a plain chest is for the adults and then the streaking for the juveniles. Um, but yeah, so black-throated sparrows are pretty local. And if you find one out of their, out of their normal range, you're pretty lucky. And if you are in their range down, especially in Western Colorado or locally on the, in Southeast, this is a song you might hear. I usually listen for that little, uh, that little whistling of the notes in the middle. And I think this is our final one in this group is the swamp sparrow, which um, like the tree sparrow and like some of the other sparrows later is only found in the winter time. And they're found in wet areas, mostly in Eastern Colorado, but they can show up anywhere in the state. And the swamp sparrows, they have a grayish chest with, uh, with a brownish back and, uh, and sometimes they have brownish flanks as well, which you can't really see on this bird. And sometimes they do have very faint streaks on the chest. You can kind of see that here. And sometimes they have a little bit of a spot and they look really similar to a Lincoln sparrow, which we'll talk about later, which is a small streaked sparrow. Um, some other things to look for on the swamp sparrow is this white throat and then this plain a uh, fairly gray face with this black line through it. Um, and they're pretty much just grayish and brown overall. So you can see the chest is this light gray color. Um, the, the back is, the neck and the face are pretty gray as well. And then the back is, is brownish with, with black stripes. And there's a, there's a light contrast between the throat and the, and the chest. So you see there's a, there's a white throat here and then it gradually goes down into this gray. And it's not a very sharp, sharp contrast, which is different from the, the white-throated sparrow, which we'll see later. And because swamp sparrows don't breed in Colorado, we usually don't hear them sing. So this is what their call sounds like. If you hear this call coming from a marsh, there's a chance here you should uh, look for a swamp sparrow. That's harsher and flatter than a lot of uh, I think it's flatter than a lot of uh, other sparrows you'll hear, especially in the in the winter time, like the song sparrow, which we'll talk about later. So the swamp sparrow looks pretty similar to a Lincoln's or a song sparrow, but but they like the streaking. So if you're pretty familiar with the Lincoln sparrow and you see one, the bird that looks similar without any streaking on the chest here, there's a good chance, especially if you're in the winter time, that you might be looking at a swamp sparrow. And just a side note, we're not going to cover it here because juveniles just add a whole other level of difficulty to all this. But many of these juveniles of these species, when they hatch in, in, in August and early September, especially, they can have streaking in the early fall. So birds like chipping sparrow and clay colored and brewers, sometimes you will see them when they're in their streaked plumage. And those, those can be really challenging to tell. And there's some very subtle differences that I haven't even mastered yet to tell tell a like juvenile chipping and brewer sparrows apart um, and they can definitely trip up a lot of people so that's just another thing to note is that if you do see a streaked sparrow there is a there is a chance that it was one of the ones we covered especially if you see one around this time of year and our next uh, category is going to be the small streaked sparrows these are the five ones that we have in colorado that are fairly small again that's a kind of subjective and they're streaked. Um, <clears throat> the first one is a sagebrush sparrow, which is pretty much around only in the summertime. Um, and they mostly breed in Western Colorado on the West Slope. I think the, the main spot that they breed on the East Slope is down in the San Luis Valley. And they do show up rarely, but annually as migrants along the front range. So it's always a bird to keep an eye out for. Um, and unlike a lot of the birds in this group, they do, they only have light streaking on the chest. It's typically uh, restricted to the sides and a little bit in the middle. You can see there's a faint amount of streaking on the on the flanks over here. And their chest is typically pure white. Um, a lot of the other birds we're looking at have like brownish or gray chest. And the this, uh, sagebrush sparrow is typically a whiter, whiter bird. It gives me a white and sand color, like dark brown sand color impression with a with a bluish gray head. Um, this this color combination is kind of kind of unusual. 
um, in the sparrows. It does look similar to the uh, to the immature black throated sparrow, but um, but unlike that, it has a really thick white malar stripe. You can see here. There's only a tiny amount of black bordering between the malar stripe and the throat. That also, unlike the black throated sparrow, which has this long uh, white supercilium, there's only a little white spot in front of the eye on the sagebrush sparrow. Um, and it also has a white eye ring and then uh, this uh, light, light brown back with, uh, with these really fine streaks on it. There aren't too many other sparrows you'll see that have uh, streaking this fine on the back. And then also we do have a, a dark tail with a little bit of white on the edge. It's not too many sparrows have this white on the edge. And this is a bird that shows it just a, a tiny amount. Uh, but if you see a bird that has this in the, in the sagebrush habitat, which is where most sightings occur of sagebrush sparrows, um, sagebrush or rabbit brush on the west slope or the San Luis Valley, um, you're going to want to look for this, this, this bluish gray head and the, and the white chest with, the, with a faint amount of streaking. Um, and that's, those are going to be some clues to key you in that it might be a sagebrush sparrow. Then if you see this white, this white eye ring and the thick white mallard stripe and the white spot in front of the eye, then you're pretty, pretty sure that that's what you're looking at. The next one is a savanna sparrow, which is one of our most common uh, sparrows in the state. And they can be found pretty much throughout, throughout the state in, the, in areas that have a little bit of moisture. So they breed in wet meadows. Um, and you can see them as migrants most, most places where there is a little bit of moisture. Um, and they're, they're rare. Um, they're rare in the winter time, so they're pretty much you're pretty much only going to encounter them in the summer during migration. And this is a small sparrow with a short tail and uh, and the streakings is like moderate level streakings on the chest. Um, and it's it's kind of hard to judge thickness sometimes, but if you, as you can see in this picture, these these streaks aren't like terribly thick or terribly thin. Um, and they also have this uh, this like brownish sandy color overall. And another really good thing to look for on the savanna sparrow is the is the yellow in the face. You can see over here. Uh, he has this yellow uh, on the supercilium in front of the eye. And all savanna sparrows do have a paler colored supercilium or this eyebrow. And then typically there's a little bit of yellow either above the eye into the front or just in front of the eye or in the face somewhere. Um, and they do have a paler mellow stripe as well, as well as pink legs, which are a good thing uh, to tell them apart from some other species that have dark legs. But if you're in the grasslands and you see a small streaked sparrow, um, I think it might be a savanna. Look for that yellow in the face and the pink legs, and then you can be pretty sure that that's what you're looking at. Uh, and if you see a bird with a yellow yellow in the face on the grasslands, but but it doesn't have streaks on it, then then you're probably looking at a grasshopper sparrow. Um, and here's a savanna sparrow song. It's a little bit longer and a little bit less buzzy than the grasshopper sparrow. But it is buzzier than the Vesper sparrow, which we'll talk about next. The next is the Vesper sparrow, which is kind of similar to the Savannah sparrow, except for a couple of key differences. Um, unfortunately, one of them is not as visible in this picture as I would like. Um, and these, these birds can breed throughout most of Colorado. They breed up in the mountain and some of these meadowy areas as well down on the grasslands. Um, and they have this brownish sandy color overall as well. It's, I find it like a little less bright than a savanna sparrow. Um, and they also have these moderate to thin streaks on the chest as well as a white mallard stripe, which you can't really see in this picture. It kind of comes down as a check mark. So it goes from here and loops around um, like a little check mark. And one of the best things to look for in a Vesper sparrow, if you see a small streak sparrow is this eye ring. That's something I always look for to know if a bird might be a Vesper sparrow. And they also have a rufous shoulder patch, which you can't really see here, which is something that a lot of people sometimes mistake for a Lapland long spur, which doesn't have this white eye ring. And then also a good thing to look for for Vesper sparrows, especially if you're trying to tell them from savannas and you don't get a good look at the face, they have white in the outer tail feathers. So, um, so the, the outer portion of the outer tail feather is white. So if you kick up a bird on the grasslands that has white, white bordering the edge of the tail, if you're pretty sure it's a sparrow and not a long spur, uh, you're probably looking at a Vesper sparrow. And I would try to see it on the ground and maybe see if you can see that white eye ring as well as the streaking on the chest and the white, the white mallard stripe. And this is what a Vesper sparrow sounds like. It's a little more musical than the Savannah sparrow. It has these two, uh, two longer introductory notes 
which separated from the song sparrow, which we'll hear later. Yes, this one has three three long descending introductory notes. The next one is the Baird Sparrow. This is a species I studied in Colorado and it's pretty rare and local and a lot of you people probably won't encounter unless you're up in, in Northern Larimer or Wilk counties. Um, but they're really special to me and they have been becoming more and more common in Colorado. I think there was a bird up on territory down in the metro area this, this summer, late early fall. So they're becoming more and more common. So it's definitely a species to keep an eye out for. Um, but like I said, they are a rare breeder at a couple couple locations in Larimer and Weld counties, and they're rare migrants, but they, they have been showing up more and more often, so it's a good species to keep in the back of your mind. And unlike most of the other species that we've seen that have streaking all over the chest and down the sides, leaving just the belly blank, the, uh, the bear sparrow just has a streak necklace on it, and that's a really good thing to look at for them. In addition to this buffy color in the face, they're they're kind of whitish overall and, and brownish reddish on the back with this yellow buffy all over the face, um, as well as this black spot behind the eye and a, and a thin eye ring. I like the grasshopper sparrow, which it's uh, used to be considered related to. They're they're in different genera now, but it has a fairly fairly large bill, so that's something to look for is a large bill um, and the necklace. So if you're looking at a migrant sparrow and you think it might be a Barrett sparrow, the things I would I would really look for are this 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 buffy face, this black couple black spots behind the eye on a on a plain buffy face, a large bill and streaking on the uh, the streaking necklace on the chest, and that's what you're gonna want to look for on a Barrett sparrow. And if you are lucky enough to be up in in northern Colorado in the summertime, this is a song that you might hear. They're pretty uncommon, but this is what the Barrett sparrow sounds like. It's very musical. It's one of the most musical birds we have out in the prairie. And that covers all the small sparrows that we've learned, I think, 10 or 11 species by now um, that are all smaller. And now we're going to move on to the larger species you can tell. Um, if a bird is a little bit larger on the smaller scale for sparrows. And these are the large unstreaked sparrows. So we have, it looks like five species here that we're going to cover. And the first one is the most common of the group. It's the white crown sparrow, which we can see up in the mountains throughout the summertime, as well as throughout the plains and pretty much the entire state and especially along river corridors in the winter time. And these guys really, really love rabbit brush in the winter. And in the summer, you can see them in in meadows and even even up to the tree line. This is one of the few birds. I think the only sparrow we have in Colorado that can nest above or right at tree line. Um, and some things I really like to look for on them are this, uh, for a larger sparrow, they have this pale pale gray chest, which is pretty pretty unique amongst them. And the throat is pale. You see there's no, there's no obvious mallard stripe anywhere from the belly up to this line behind the eye is this pretty uniform gray color on both the adults down here in the bottom and the juvenile. The juvenile does have a little bit of buffy in the face, but it's pretty uniform all throughout here. And then both the adults and the young have this line through the eye. You can see it's brown in the juvenile here and it's dark in the adult. And they get their name from this white crown stripe between, between the black caps. So they have a black cap with this white stripe running up the middle. And one thing that trips a lot of people up is the juveniles don't have that. So the juveniles, I always call them brown crown sparrows because they have a brown a brown cap with a with a lighter brown stripe going up the middle. So they can be kind of challenging to tell. Um, <clears throat> so so what I look for is just that overall plainness to them. You have these uh, pale pale and dark stripes going down the back, and a faint this like faint white wing bar. You can see, and then another thing I look for is the bill. The bill is either the, the pinkish or yellow color, um, which a lot of the a lot of the other sparrows don't don't have. A lot of them have darker beaks. And unlike a lot of other birds, this uh, this sparrow is found in fairly large flocks throughout the winter. They can also be mixed species flocks. So if you find a white ground sparrow flock, it might be a good 
time to look for a bird like a Harris's sparrow or a golden crown sparrow or a white a white throated sparrow which is another bird that's local but un, uncommon in the winter time and you also see them in fall migration they should start showing up about now i think um and they have a white belly with a gray chest as you can see in this picture and then they have a really thick supercilium i don't think we've seen a, a sparrow with a supercilium this thick um in our presentation yet tonight and i don't think we will and the supercilium can either be white or tan color there's two different uh, i don't even know if they're subspecies there's just two different types of uh of white-throated sparrows and they can uh again this uh this supercilium can either be tan or white this this individual is white and then it's got this yellow spot in front of the eye kind of like the the sagebrush sparrow had that white spot and the uh the grasshopper sparrow has this yellow spot and so does the savannah sparrow the the white-throated sparrow also has that but like the white crown sparrow it's pretty plain on the on the lower half of the face and uh, one thing we really noticed is this bright white throat it doesn't have a valor stripe at all it just has this bright white throat that sharply contrasts with the rest of the it has kind of a gradual and less well-defined transition this is this is a pretty crisp um crisp border here so this whole this whole border is you can tell it's gray on gray on one side and white on the other side it doesn't doesn't look blurry at all and then because oops sorry i forgot to do the lincoln sparrow we'll get back to that in a second um and because we don't see them i've only heard i think maybe one ever sing in Colorado. Here's the here's a chip note of the white throated sparrow. Well, it's actually fairly similar to the swamp sparrow, which is a little bit different, but they typically occur in different habitats. We can compare that to the color of the white the white crown sparrow. Just a little bit flatter and we'll go back i completely spaced over the lincoln sparrow which is one of our more common sparrows in in colorado we see them as migrants all the time throughout the front range and, and other parts of the state um, but they breed in the mountains in the middle of the state and they're rare they're rare in the winter and fairly common as migrants and uh one thing we want to look for with them is they just give off this uh, kind of grayish overall impression um if you saw the whole bird you would think that uh right now the main thing we're seeing is this buffy chest which kind of in this picture makes it kind of have a buffy impression but it's mostly just a chest that's buffy um with a with a like a paler paler gray or white belly um and the the biggest thing on the lincoln sparrow to look for is these very fine streaks on the chest um, you can see these are much thinner than any of the other sparrows we've looked at today that's a really good sign that you're looking at a lincoln sparrow i like the swamp sparrow they do have a white throat and a kind of a plain gray face with a with a little bit of a line going behind the eye, and then a rufous crown with a gray with a gray stripe in the middle. Um, they also the Lincoln sparrows also have a thin buffy eye ring and and this white throat. And here's the Lincoln sparrow song. It almost sounds like a combination between a toe and a thrush to me. And that's a Lincoln Sparrow song. I'm make sure I don't jump too far ahead now. Now we're back on the large and unstreaked sparrows. Sorry, we had to go back for a second to the smaller streaked sparrows again. Another large and unstreaked sparrow that we're going to have in Colorado is a lurk sparrow, which is found throughout most of Colorado in the summertime, especially out on the prairie, though. That's where I typically see them. But they do occur up, up in the foothills in the summer as well. Um, and they have one of the cleanest chests of any sparrow. You see this, there's no, there's no markings at all here except for this dark spot. And unlike a lot of sparrows, which have these subtle, subtle plumages, the lurk sparrow just hits you with, with how, how sharp and crisp its plumage is. You have this dark chestnut spot, large spot behind the ear, um, this chestnut cap, which is just this rich, rich color. And then they have a black and white face. So there's a white supercilium, a black line through the eye, a white 
white stripe below the eye and then a white mallard stripe. Uh, so it's all like black, white, black, white with a little bit of chestnut in it. Um, and another thing to look for in the lark sparrow, especially if you flush one, is they do have fairly large uh, long tails with, uh, with white around the edge. So um, this is typically a fairly easy sparrow to identify if you get a good look, especially at that face pattern. I don't think we've seen any other sparrows tonight that have that distinctive of a face. And here's a lark sparrow song. It sounds fairly similar to a lot of the birds we've heard today. Almost reminds me of a thrasher or something that doesn't repeat itself. And this is a song that I've always struggled with and still still haven't found a good a good key to, to know if a bird's a lark sparrow or something more similar. The next one is one of my favorite sparrows, the Cassin Sparrow, which is pretty much on the eastern plains, sometimes getting into the front range in the summertime. Um, and they're usually associated with patches of yucca or rabbit brush. And if you see a bird up in the mountains, you think it might be a cast and sparrow, it might, it might be good to consider other options, but there is a, always a chance that, that one of these birds could get lost. And they're really challenging to identify just because they're pretty much gray and nondescript overall. Um, they do have some of these darker reddish spots on the back and a little bit of reddish behind the eye. Um, but some things I look for on them are this long, long tail, um, this thick bill, and they have a very, very faint eye ring, but pretty much if I see a bird that's super drab and I really don't know what it is and it's a sparrow out on the plains, I'm, I'm gonna start considering casting sparrow and hoping that maybe it goes up and sings because that's one of the best ways to identify them. You can sometimes hear them from like 500 yards away. It's very high pitch and musical. And people always say that the end of the song sounds like a rusty gate squeaking back and forth. And that's the cast and sparrow. In some years, uh, parts of the state will have a lot of them. In other years, there won't be as many. They can, their numbers can fluctuate a lot with, with the moisture throughout the state and throughout other parts of their range. They're mostly a southern species, so they're more common the further south you get on the eastern plains. But in some years, we can get decent numbers up in northern Colorado. Um, out on the Pawnee and soapstone prairies, but mostly I've seen them down, especially like along the Arkansas Valley um, in the in the deserty scrub up up above the river. And the next is the Rufus Crown Sparrow, which is very local to the canyons in southeastern Colorado, coming up the Arkansas about as far as uh, as Canyon City, but mostly mostly if you're going to encounter this bird, it's going to be uh, in Canyon City directly or down down in places like Picture Canyon or um, the Higby Cemetery down, uh, down near Los Animas. Um, and again, like the Canyon Toey and the Black-Throated Sparrow, it's pretty, pretty local habitat-wise. You, you probably need some rocks around, some of these rock canyons to find a rufous crown Sparrow. And they're pretty similar. Uh, the back half of them is pretty similar to the Casson Sparrow, just kind of dull and nondescript overall. Um, but if you look at the face, it's a little bit different. You have this bold eye ring, um, this rufous cap, and then also this dark dark line behind the eye, and then a white or paler, at least, uh, mallard stripe and supercilium. So if you, if you looked at the back of this bird, I, I don't know if I could tell you if this was a Cassins or a rufous crown sparrow, but if you look at the front, you see this bold, oops, you see this bold white eye ring and the rufous, rufous crown, which gives it its name. They can also look pretty similar to canyon toeys. But Canyon Toe is always going to have the rufous um, down down in the vent area. And they're going to be more, more brownish overall and a little bit less pattern. So we're on to our final four sparrows for the talk tonight. Um, we have this the large streaked sparrows. And the first one is one of the sparrows you might be the most familiar with, which is a song sparrow, which is found in pretty much any wet area throughout Colorado. Um, and it's one of these sparrows that you can find them in the winter time almost as easily as you can find them in the in the summertime. Um, oops. And they have a pale chest, and they have like moderate to thicker streaking on them. Unlike the Lincoln Sparrow, which has really fine streaking, the Song Sparrow is always going to have some thicker streaks on the chest, and the streaks go down on the flanks as well. So the whole it almost looks like the whole bird's streaked, but the the belly right in the middle is is going to stay unstreaked. 
but the Song Sparrow definitely has more streaking than most sparrows we're going to see. And typically they get this grayish or brownish overall impression. You can see this bird looks very gray, a little bit of reddish on the back. Um, it's going to have this rufous cap with a gray stripe up the middle like a lot of other sparrows have, and it's going to have this dark, dark line going behind the eye on, on a gray face and then a paler mallard stripe. So it definitely like a lot of parts of the Song Sparrow look like a lot of other uh, birds we've seen today. But one of the things are, if you have a larger sparrow that has all this streaking on it, there's a, there's a good chance it's a song sparrow. <clears throat> and this is also one of our more common sparrows in Colorado. So it's a good one to learn really well. And we will uh, listen to the song sparrow song and then also the call because a lot of times in the winter you can find them because of their call. Here's what their song sounds like. They can be pretty variable. And one of the things that I always think they sound like vesper sparrows, but they don't have the introductory notes. All the notes in that are fairly fairly short and distinct. Uh, it doesn't have any like buzziness or, or warbliness to it like some of the other sparrows we have. The next one is a fox sparrow, which there's a couple different kinds that show up in Colorado. There's the red, red fox sparrow, which is a rare winter visitor. And then also the slate colored fox sparrow, which breeds up in the mountains. Um, they pretty much need really nice stands of willows to find them. They're pretty local um, and you need almost a lot like uh, pure, nicer habitat, nice willow corridors along along slow moving streams are where you find fox sparrows breeding. You know, they look, look pretty variable overall. It's kind of amazing that these two birds in this picture are different species. But some things to look for, they have these really thick triangle streaks, which are much thicker than anything else we're going to see today. They're somewhere between spots and streaks. And you can see how both these birds are kind of triangular shaped. They both have fairly plain faces. You can see a little bit of pattern in the red fox sparrow down here on the gray face. And then you can see this really plain face on, this is actually a sooty fox sparrow because I don't have a picture of a slate colored one, but they're pretty similar. And then another thing to look for is this, uh, this like fairly thick and cone shaped bill. It's very pointed. Um, and sometimes it's even a slightly, slightly up curved. So these are things to look for. If you, if you see a large sparrow that has thick, uh, streaks this thick, it might be a good idea to start considering fox sparrow. Um, and maybe sometimes song sparrows can look pretty similar, but you almost never never see them this uh, with streaks this thick. And then also their facial pattern, if we go back to slide, the song sparrow has a little bit more pattern going on in the face, especially this white mallard stripe, whereas the fox sparrow has a plainer face. And the next is the Harris's sparrow, which is a rare and local uh, winter visitor. Some areas they can be, you can see a, a decent number, maybe five or so in a day, the further east you get. But especially along the front range, uh, they're, they're a lot less common. And we typically see maybe a couple every winter. Uh, and usually when I see them, they are in flocks of white crowned sparrows or in similar habitat to where white crowned sparrows spend the winter. And when I'm looking for Harris's sparrow, the, the things I always look for are this plain tan face. You can see this face right here has almost almost no markings on it at all. And then this bright pink bill. If you if you see this plain tan face and a bright pink bill with some streaking on the chest of a large sparrow, you might want to start considering Harris's sparrow. Um, and they don't have really thick streaking or a lot of streaking like a song sparrow or a fox sparrow, um, but they do have a little bit of streaking on them. And then if, you, if you're lucky enough to get to see one in breeding plumage, which I've never seen before, as you can see, the adults have a, have a black face. So this whole area in front of the eye from, from the crown down to the throat would be solid black, which is a really cool thing about Harris's sparrow. But typically, this is the plumage that we see them in in the wintertime. So that's why I included this slide. And then our final one is a lark bunting, um, which we visited earlier. Um, but is also a sparrow and in some plumages is large and fairly streaked. Um, like we talked about the males, they're, uh, <clears throat> they're fairly short tailed, they're fairly big headed, as you can see in this bird. And then one of the things that really clues me in that this is a lark bunting, or the two things are that this, this, the bill in this bird is massive. I don't know if we have any other sparrows we've seen tonight that have a bill this big. And then they also have this white patch in the wing. So they have a white shoulder patch. 
uh, which which is the which the adult males have, which typically shows up in other plumages as well, just not um, just a little more subtle. And like a lot of sparrows we've seen tonight, they do have this white mallard stripe, and they're just a sandy brown color overall with streaking on the chest and a white throat. So it's a lot of times, a lot of times these will confuse me because I'm used to them being on the prairie, but we will get them in my migration in in areas with rabbit brush or other scrubby areas and. And it typically takes me seeing that white shoulder patch to realize I'm looking at a lark bunting. And if I'm staring at it a while, I might notice a short tail or I might especially notice that really thick bill, um, which is for the lark sparrow. So now that we've gone through all the sparrows that you're probably likely to encounter in Colorado, um, it's time to let you practice your own skills. So I'm gonna put up a sparrow and I'll give you like a minute or two to look at each. And then I'll walk you through the identification. This is the first one. Hopefully, it was fairly easy for you. This is one of the unique sparrows. It has a has a pink bill, which not many birds we saw today have. I remember the field sparrow and the Harris's sparrow have that, but they also have a lot of pattern or streaking or an eye ring. This bird has like no streaking on it. Um, it's grayish in the head. It's it's pinkish or brownish on the sides, and this is a dark eyed junco. Um, so it's one of the sparrows without any streaking or any patterns on it with that pink bill. Then you can also see the white in the tail over here. Here's the next one. This picture's a little grainy because it was a little dark. I'll give you a hint. This was taken in some desert habitat. It's hard to know. Hopefully I'm not rushing through these too quickly, but one thing you'll notice is that, is that this bird does have like a fairly long tail. Um, it doesn't have any pattern on the back at all. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, sorry, I said my internet connection was unstable. Um, it's it's unstreaked. It has a faint white eye ring and kind of a rufous rufousy crown, um, which which almost makes me think that this might be a rufous crown sparrow. But uh, but rufous crown have pattern on the back. And also another thing to look for is this uh, rusty color under the tail, which you can see. And then also this buffy throat, um, which uh, rufous crown would have a whiter throat and wouldn't have this patch under the tail. And this is a canyon toey right here. Now we'll move on to the next one. There it goes. This isn't a very good picture, but this might be similar to the look that you're going to get in the field. So I'll give you a minute or two to look at him. So we're going to notice that this is one of the unstreaked sparrows and uh, because I saw this bird in real life, I'm going to tell you that it's a small sparrow. Um, one of the things we're going to look for is it does have like a rusty, a rusty cap. And it's got this line through the eye and it's kind of kind of got these stripes on the back. And just looking at this bird overall, it makes me jump to the chipping clay colored brewers bunch because um, that's what most of the small, small unstreaked sparrows are. It doesn't, it doesn't have a really noticeable eye ring that I can tell. It's not the best picture. It's got some pattern on the face. Um, but if you zoom, if you look hard enough, you can see that there's this dark spot um, between the eye and the bill and the lores. And that's what tells me that this is a chipping sparrow, which also goes well with having this clean, uh, this gray neck back here and this, and this roof is crown and the rusty cap. So um, these are all things that lead me to chipping sparrow. And this dark, dark line between the eye and the bill is just the, just the thing that clinches it for me. Here's the next one. Okay, so if we saw this bird, we're gonna, the first thing we're gonna notice is that it's very streaky on it. 
Um, then it's hard, it's hard to judge the size in this picture, but this bird is fairly small and it does have this kind of brownish gray overall impression. And the thing, the two things that jump out to me the most is that it's got a buffy colored breast and the streaks are pretty thin. So that, that's gonna point me straight to Lincoln Sparrow um, with these thin streaks on a buffy breast on a bird that's this gray overall. And other things to look at are this faint uh, little buffy eye ring and the, and the rufous crown and the, the, the face that's, that's fairly gray. Um, but, but again, these, uh, these thin streaks in the buffy chest are what uh, really, really jump out to me for Lincoln Sparrow. <clears throat> Andy, it was suggested that you give us a hint about the size of the bird. Yeah, yeah. Here's a here's a bird. I'll, I'll give you guys like ten or twenty seconds, then I'll give you a hint about the size, and then I'll start explaining it. Um, and maybe as I'm explaining, pointing out some of the features, you'll remember what the. Um, what they are. So this is a fairly large sparrow. Um, and hopefully like the Lincoln sparrow in the last picture, you keyed under the streaking right here. And unlike the Lincolns, which had this really fine thin streaking, um, you can see that these streaks are really thick, which should clue you into one, one bird that we talked about today, uh, which also has this yellow bill and a plain face. And it's one of the large streak sparrows. Um, and this is a fox sparrow here. So you can see this large, uh, these really thick streaks on it. Uh, Thick uh, streaks, and ho hopefully a lot of you guys are able to get this because I think this is actually the same individual, just in a different pose than uh, one of the early, earlier pictures. I'm gonna try to go on to the next one. Okay, here's the next picture, and again, like the Canyon Toey, we're gonna be in kind of some shrubby, deserty areas in, in southern Colorado on this one. Let's let's say. And this bird is fairly small, even though you can't really tell in the picture. And when I see this bird, the, the first thing that jumps out to me are this like really bold face pattern. And I think we only had two birds tonight that have a really bold face pattern. There's a lark sparrow and the black-throated sparrow. The lark sparrow had all this chestnut and it was a very like white, white and a little bit of black in the face. Whereas the black-throated sparrow had a lot of black and gray in the face with a little bit of white and then this obvious black throat. So um, in addition to the, the gray overall and the, the unstreaked back, which you really can't see that well, but it looks pretty plain to me right now. You can tell that this is a black throated sparrow. Here's another one. I didn't get a very good picture of it, but maybe you're looking through like blurry binoculars. And this is a fairly small, smaller sparrow. It's hard to tell in this picture, but there is a tiny little bit of streaking on the sides here and a little bit in the chest. This is a bird you're probably going to encounter in western Colorado, but could show up on the on the front range. Some some of the things I'm noticing are this are this very, very white, white chest. It's because of the blurriness of the picture, it's hard to see the faint streaks on the shoulder and in the in the middle. And then also we see we see it's got this kind of bluish gray head, which I think only one or two birds we talked about tonight had. Um, one of which was the uh, was the immature black throated sparrow. But we see this bird has a really thick white mallard stripe, and the black throated sparrow had a white mallard stripe and also a white supercilium. But this bird doesn't have that; it only has a little white patch in front of the eye. And that combined with, if you could see it, there'd be a brown back with these really fine streaking on the back. And all that combined with the white chest and the, especially the, the blue gray head and the white spot in front of the eye make me cue into sagebrush sparrow for this bird. Here's the next one. These, these pictures in this section are definitely a lot more like you, you might see in the field. They're not super sharp or super crisp. Um, so it's going to take a little bit of work to try to figure them out. Well, this is a fair, fairly uh, a smaller sparrow that you might see out on the grasslands. <clears throat> I 
And some of the things that might jump out on this bird are really, it's got a really buffy face over, over the entire face. It does have streaking on it, so we know it's not a grasshopper sparrow. Um, Savannah sparrow was another bird that had yellow in the face, but that was mostly restricted in front of the eye, between the eye and the bill. And this bird doesn't have streaking that goes down the side like a, like a savannah does. It's got streaking that only forms a little necklace across the chest. And if you add all that up, combined with the black spots behind the eye and the thicker bill and the thin eye ring, which you can kind of see, that makes this a Baird sparrow. Oops. Here's an next bird, which is a little tricky. This is kind of a little bit of a larger bird. And hopefully there's two things you guys notice right away about it, which, uh, or maybe not even right away. Maybe, maybe you'll get to them eventually be like, oh, that, there's two things about this bird that look very different from all the other birds we've seen tonight. <clears throat> but we can tell this bird is a little bit larger. It's got some streaking on the chest. I guess the streaks are fairly fine, but a Lincoln sparrow would have a buffy, a buffier chest, and it would look a little bit different. This bird has a different color gray. It looks a little more sandy colored. And if you look at this bill, this bill is just massive on this bird. Uh, so hopefully that's one of the one of the things that jumped out to you guys was this massive, massive bill. But another thing is I don't know if we've seen any other sparrows <clears throat> tonight that have this this much white in the shoulder patch. A lot of them maybe have a little bit of rufus or some other patterning, but this bird has a lot of white right in that shoulder patch. And combined with this massive bill, these are two things that really jump out for lark bunting for me. You can see this bird is starting to get into some summer plumage. It's getting a little bit of black in the face. Um, it has a little bit of a mallard stripe, which is another thing to look for in a lark bunting. But if you just look at this massive bill and the white shoulder patch, that, that should really cue you into lark bunting. Here's another bird. It's not a perfect example. This is a larger, a little bit of a larger sparrow. picture was taken in Loveland in the winter time, if that gives you any clues. <clears throat> some of the first things that jump out to me in addition to the a little bit larger size are there's, there's some streaks on the chest. Um, they're not super thin, they don't look super thick, except for some of these do look a little bit thicker. Um, it has this pretty much grayish overall impression. It has a white, a white mallard stripe and some rufus on the crown and behind the eye and a gray face. And these birds I'm realizing they're kind of nondescript and hard to, hard to identify, but this is, this is one of our most common sparrows in Colorado. This is a song sparrow, um, which again, you can tell it's got a little bit thicker streaking on the chest. If you saw it in real life, you could see it was a little bit larger and just gives this overall gray impression with, uh, with the brown, the brown and gray on the face. Here's an expert. It looks like it's a little, little concealed by a bush, but hopefully, um, hopefully you can tell what it is because some of the most obvious, uh, obvious marks on it are are showing. And I think it's a little bit of a larger, larger bird, but hopefully you don't need that to, to identify this one. I'll give you a minute to think about it. It's one of the first things, there's, there's three or four things that really jump out to me. You can see this white throat here, which might, might be, make you think about a bird like a white-throated or a swamp sparrow, but there's a couple of things that should, should point you away from that. It's really grayish overall. Uh, and the only thing other than the white throat that I noticed that isn't, isn't this dark gray is this bright and rusty cap and this yellowish green on, this, on the wings and also on the tail. And the tail's fairly long. And if you remember from the very beginning of the presentation, there's only one species that ever shows this yellowish green on the body um, like this. And this is a green-tailed towhee. Okay, here's the next one. You're looking at a small, a small bird, a little bit distantly through a scope, and it's a little windy, so it's not, it's not in the best of focus.
So the, the first couple of things I would look for on this bird are, we know, we, we know it's a smaller bird. Um, we can look at the chest and see that there's no streaking on the chest. So that kind of limits it down. We, we might think about the chipping or the clay colored. Clay colored has this puppy chest as well. There's almost no pattern in the face. And we see this yellow spot in front of the eye. And unlike the other birds, this, uh, this bird has a really short tail and short wings. Um, so we see this buffy pattern overall, not, not much pattern in the face with the yellow spot in front of the eye and the yellow shoulder. And also we notice the bill's a little bit bigger too. And this should all point us in the direction of grasshopper sparrow. Okay, here's our next bird. This is a smaller bird and we're gonna, this might be coming to a friend's bird feeder in the winter time. This bird is not in the winter time because he's, he's singing. Um, I took this picture up in Alaska where I live now. So given, given that this is one of the smaller sparrows, we're gonna look and see that the chest isn't streaked. Unfortunately, he is hiding uh, one, of the, one of the best features of him, which, which sparrows often do. A lot of times we're not gonna to get to see all the features that we talked about for every single sparrow today. So a lot of times you have to go on just a couple of them and maybe you might be missing one, of the, one or two of the most distinctive ones. Um, so he's hiding, he does have a spot on the chest over here, which you can't see. But we can see that he does have some wing bars here. He's got a pretty gray face and a, and a reddish cap and a thin red line behind the eye. And if we look at the bill, oh, we notice that the top part, the upper mandible is black and the lower part, the lower mandible is yellow. So this is a bicolored bill and there weren't many species of sparrows that we had uh, that, that show that pattern. Um, and especially for a smaller unstreaked sparrow in the winter time, uh, if we see that, uh, that bicolored bill and see that it's got these wing bars, we know that it's probably gonna be an American tree sparrow. Um, there is a chance that maybe some dark eyed juncos uh, could be around in the winter and show a different color bill, but they're not gonna have any of this patterning. So this bicolored bill along with the on street chest are gonna really point us in the direction of American tree, tree sparrow for this bird. Here's another bird, the bird's right here. Again, you might, you might get a distant look at him. This is a larger sparrow and it's a little hard to see, but you can see some faint streaking along the sides over here. And these are not, um, but those aren't the two things I would look for when I'm looking at this bird. I'll give you a minute to look at some of the other, other aspects of it and see if you can identify it. It's another bird you might see, let's say it's like November and we're out, we're out on, the, on the front range or even on the Eastern Plains and a little bit of vegetation. We're not on the grasslands. We're in a nice patch of rabbit brush. And there's a flock of white crown sparrows around. We're gonna notice that this bird's a little bit bigger than the white crown sparrows and does have, does have this, uh, a little bit of streaking on the chest. But two things are, that we're really gonna key into after studying this bird for a little bit that are, that are different than the white crown sparrows. His face is really plain. He doesn't have doesn't have any, any stripes through the eye or much of a different color crown. We see a really plain tan face. And we're gonna see this thick, this thick orange beak. And that's gonna point us in the direction of Harris's sparrow. Here's another bird. This is a smaller sparrow. We're gonna see out on the Eastern Plains in the summertime. So let's say you're working a, a migrant flock in a little city park out in Holly or something, you might, or Lamar, you might, you might see a bird that looks like this. And you might say this bird does like nothing on, it's got no streaking, it's got almost no pattern in the face. I might see a small hint of a rusty cap. It's throat, it might be a little bit more whitish. The mallard might be a little bit different. And then you're gonna notice two things, hopefully. You're gonna notice this bird has a white eye ring. It's also got a pink bill. We just showed the Harris's sparrow, uh, which has a pink bill, so does a white crown sparrow. But they have, they have some pattern in their face, or the white crowns do, and the Harris's is large and streaked. 
uh, juncos they don't have much pattern but they're they're also never this uniform they're really dark and they have a white belly so we're going to realize a bird with a white eye ring which is pretty plain overall especially in the face with a bright pink bill is going to be a field sparrow here's another one it's getting a little bit late so the, the light's a little bad on this uh smaller smaller sparrow we're going to see out in the grasslands And some of the ID features don't show up too well on this bird, unfortunately. Uh, but a couple that do, we're gonna see these, uh, we're gonna see these thin streaking on it that go all the way down the side. So we know it's not a bear, it's sparrow because the, the streaking goes down, goes down the side. It's kind of the sandy color overall. Uh, and the thing that hopefully stands out to us the most, it does have a bicolored bill, which I guess some other sparrows do have. Uh, but some of the pink is bleeding up into the upper mandible. And we know it's not a tree sparrow because it has a bright white eye ring. And for the small and streaked sparrows, I think Vesper was the only one, the only sparrow that had that. Um, and this is a really good thing to look for on a, on a Vesper sparrow is this bright white eye ring. If you see a, if you see a sparrow with streaking on it, and especially if it's on the ground. I even have to take a second to identify this one. We're gonna see this in, a, in like a migrant flock and you can see this on a migrant flock in the front range or almost anywhere in the state. And this is a, this is a smaller bird too. I can't quite see all the features with him. Um, but some things we're going to notice is it's small and it doesn't have any streaks on the chest. So that's going to narrow it down quite a bit. And if we look at the, the overall pattern, we're going to hopefully start moving towards the chipping clay colored uh, brewer's direction. And we're going to notice that it doesn't really have that buffy color that a clay colored has. And if you use your imagination or maybe clean off your binoculars, because it was like a nice snowy day when, it, when this picture was taken, you're gonna see a little bit of streaking on the neck, which is gonna rule out clay colored sparrow. And then we're gonna remember, we're gonna know that this is either a brewer's or a chipping sparrow, and they look really similar. So we're gonna zoom into the head a little bit more and see that it has a little bit of an eye ring. And also the area between the eye and the bill, there's no dark marking. So we know it can't be a chipping sparrow. So that's pretty much just gonna leave us with brewer's sparrow as our only option. A lot of times that is how I arrive at brewer's sparrow because they, uh, they just don't look like anything else and they're really, really drab and nondescript. Here's another bird we're gonna see in some of the canyon lands in, in Southern Colorado. You can see that this is even giving a little bit of habitat clue away. There are some big rocks, there are some rocks in the background. This bird is maybe medium size, maybe a little bit larger than, than a chipping sparrow too, so to give you a hint on the size. This is one of the trickier ones, especially if you're not used to seeing this species. They're a little bit more common elsewhere. And most of us probably don't encounter this species in Colorado regularly at all. Um, but some things we're going to notice are that it's pretty clean on the chest, but it does have some pattern on the back. Um, which is going to, I saw some people got tripped up with the canyon towie earlier, and this is going to make us know uh, that it's not a canyon towie, along with the, you can see a little bit of the vent here, and it looks a little bit whiter instead of that buffy color that a canyon towie has. Um, so if you look at this, it's a pretty nondescript sparrow. It doesn't have any streaking on it, but if we go up towards the top, it does have this white mallard and this bright white eye ring and a, and a darker cap. Uh, we're seeing this bird, it's really late in the evening, unfortunately, so we can't see that it's, it's more of a, a rufous cap. Um, and we're gonna come to the realization that this is a rufous crown sparrow. Uh, the back half of the bird does look pretty similar to Cassin's sparrow, but a Cassin's is gonna have a plainer face and not gonna have this bright rufous cap like this bird has. 
and then a brewer's sparrow wouldn't have this sharp of an of an eye ring and also um also wouldn't have this solid solid dark of a cap or this this bright um this much contrast in the face here's another bird we're seeing it kind of kind of through some depth brush a little bit far away in a, in a flock of sparrows out on the out on the eastern plains during during fall migration So we're going to notice this is a little bit of a smaller sparrow. Um, we can't get a great look at the bill. It does almost look pinkish, but um, we know that it's not a field sparrow because there's actually there's some pattern in the face and then it, it doesn't have that white eye ring. So we know it's not a field sparrow. Um, we know it's not any of the streaked sparrows because the chest is really nice and clean. Um, and we might notice that the, the neck is really gray over here and the chest is a little buffy. So that might get us thinking about clay colored sparrow but maybe we've never seen one before. I wanna make extra sure that this isn't a chipping sparrow. Um, the first thing we're gonna do when we wanna tell those two species apart, hopefully we've uh, gone over this enough today that we all remember. Um, so we're gonna look between the eye and the bill and the lures and there's gonna be nothing, no dark marks in between. So then we can tell that this is a clay colored sparrow and not a chipping or a brewer's sparrow. Or it's not a brewer's sparrow because of the bright, because how buffy the face and the, and the chest are. Brewers also doesn't have that spot between the eye. And that's all I have for the presentation tonight. Um, Very good, Andy. So, making any, any questions at all, people have any questions on sparrows or anything else. Yeah, if people want to unmute themselves and ask a question, uh, go go for it. That's fine. Or you can type your question into the chat, and I'll read it for you. So I'll, I'll start with the question, Andy. Uh, you yeah. unfortunately the, the sound quality didn't come out very well, so some people had difficulty hearing the sound. But uh, can you tell people what uh, apps or products you use to listen to sparrow sounds? Yeah, so a lot of times I use websites like eBird or Zeno Canto. You can search audio files there. Um, this was all, uh, all, the, all these audio files came from eBird. Unfortunately, I didn't, uh, didn't have enough recordings of my own to do, do very well. So this, this all came from uh, whatever the Cornell Guide to Bird sounds, where those sounds came from. Um, and again, spar blurring sparrow sounds a little bit little bit different and more challenging when you're not in the field. So I uh, wasn't wasn't trying to make that a main a main point of the presentation today. But uh, yeah, especially like websites like Xenocanto or eBird have that. And I also I use the Merlin Bird app a lot of times to to try to double check if I hear a sound and I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I find the Merlin Bird app is very helpful for it has lots of different sound types more than some of the other apps and and now you can also record bird sounds with the merlin app and it, it, it identifies the sounds for you <clears throat> any other questions for andy Andy, can you see the comments in the chat? I can. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks everybody for saying you enjoyed the presentation. I'm gonna. I'm really glad that. Uh, really glad that everybody enjoyed it, and I was able to help. Hopefully, everybody learned a little bit today um, on how to identify sparrows. Again, they can be tricky, and it actually really helped me a lot to go over this presentation because I haven't. I haven't considered sparrows. I haven't even seen a chipping or a brewers or a clay colored sparrow. And, probably like two years now, so. Here's a question from Lori Zuckerman. Let's see. Oh, well, these right. pairs that are not common in color. Let's see, I, yeah, I went through the checklist. Um, I left out a couple of the birds that are not, not only not common in Colorado, but also difficult to identify. So we have a couple species which are really skulky, which might show up more often than we realize, but they're really difficult to see. 
And those are birds like Nelson's and Henslow's and Lacan's sparrow. Um, probably with Nelson's and Lacan's being much more regular than Henslow's sparrow in Colorado. But again, very, very rare. Maybe once every year, every two years, somewhere in the state. Um, there's also Golden Crown I left off, even though they, they do show up every now and then. I probably should have included that in there. But um, but typically, if you find a Golden Crown, it's typically because somebody's going to have told you about where it is. Uh, one of the other two I missed, the Eastern Toey was one of them, which is really similar to Spotted Toey sometimes. There's a lot of hybrids out on the Eastern Plains. Um, I'm blanking on what the last one was. I'll, I'll try to look that up if anybody else has any other questions. So here's a rare sparrow that has occurred several times <clears throat> in Colorado, black chin sparrow. That was the one, yeah, that's right. And you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that field sparrow has a ping pong ball sound. Uh, that, 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 that the description of the ping pong ball uh, bouncing smaller and smaller and smaller as it goes. Uh, that yeah, so sorry, if, yeah, I realized that some people had a tough time understanding that. that that just meant that the first notes are longer, longer, and then they start getting faster and faster. Almost if you're dropping a ball on the ground, it's going to be a while between hits, and then towards the end, it's going to start going really fast. So that, that's what that that reference was to. Right, and black chin sparrow has that as well, has that quality. Yeah, black chin is a is a bird of the desert, desert southwest that's made it into western Colorado around Grand Junction a couple a couple of times. Trying to think of if there's any other birds that I left out today, but um here's a question from Bobby Tillman. Can you read it? Yeah, sure. So Bobby's asking, uh, so many of the grassland sparrows have fuzzy songs. Has anybody studied why that might be? And I have no I haven't really gotten into bird behavior much. This hasn't been one of my one of my interests in birding. So I don't know why uh, why a lot of them have that have that fuzzy sound to it. Um, it's really interesting though to be out on the grasslands and hear the difference between like a parrot's and a grasshopper sparrow. Um, like I said before, I think I've I've heard a lot of grasshopper sparrows before and have done a lot of surveys where I have to record the distance. And I remember I had one day where there was like a nice like a three mile an hour breeze like blowing in my face, and I heard I heard a grasshopper sparrow and I could actually see it and it was over a hundred yards away. But I think that only happened once or twice. So it's a really quiet song. And then I've had Baird sparrow I, the uh, one of the times I detected them in a new area that we didn't know about, um, I think I originally detected them from like 700 meters away. So, uh, so you can hear birds from a long ways away, and you can't hear grasshopper sparrows from very far at all. So, there must be there must be something to that, but I have no clue what it is. Um, yeah, and again, that's about about volume instead of buzziness. So. All right, we'll see if there, if there are any more questions. Oh yeah, Zoe is saying that the spotted tail is always, she always, always associates them with the mute call. And I can play that, I, I downloaded that as well. Um, but in addition to their song, a lot of these sparrows have calls and a lot of the calls are not very distinctive at all. They're just kind of high pitched things, but I think this should be the, um, the spotted toby call that Zoe's referring to. So you'll you'll often hear that sound coming from the brush, and and actually too another another neat thing about toeys is that uh, when when we do our bird surveys for uh, for an organization like Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, we have to record how how we detected the birds, and it's either usually by like singing or call or voice. And there's also a category for other which is if like you hear a bird's wing beats or something, which happens with like ruffed grouse a lot up in the Black Hills. And uh, Spotted Toey was a bird that would show up on that list fairly often because you you could often uh, detect them or first first hear them from uh, from them scratching on the ground. So they'll, they'll hop back and forth, uh, moving leaves around to try to find insects under them. So sometimes if you're sitting really still in, in the foothills, you might, you might hear some leaves rustling around. It might think it's like a large animal, like a mountain lion or a bobcat or something. And, then you finally see it and it's just a little toey sitting there. So that's always something to keep an eye out for them.
Just a reminder that uh, there may still be some seats available on Andy's uh, spare identification field trip uh, this coming Sunday at 7 a.m. It's going to be held at uh, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge. So it, it, it's a it, uh, registration fee is $50. It's a fundraiser for CFO. Uh, but take advantage of this opportunity while you still can. Okay, I tried to send it with Quince. I sent a message. Maybe it's because it uh, the trip is full. It's possible. I'll try to figure that out in the next couple of minutes. Awesome, cool again. Yeah, thanks for everybody for showing up tonight. And I really, really hope you learned something. Typically, if anybody else has seen me present before, I usually try to do like entertainment stuff and make it so you learn as little as possible and see a bunch of cool pictures. But um, it was nice having to put together a presentation where hopefully, hopefully you guys learned, uh, learned a lot of new stuff tonight. And hopefully uh, throughout, throughout the rest of the, the fall and into the winter, you can start uh, practicing your spare identification. This is a good, good time of year for that. And hopefully once spring rolls around, especially in May, when you get a lot of these big sparrow flocks, you can, you can still remember all these, all these little details and, um, I think as somebody, as Nick probably said in the comments, that this uh, the the recording of this video will be available uh, on the CFO website, and we're really hoping that we can use uh, CFO can keep keep putting out material like this so people can uh, can learn uh, how to identify all these different groups of birds that are they can be confusing. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, Andy, thank you very much, and uh, we will. Uh, say good night to everybody and uh, look forward to seeing you in one of these workshops in the future. Okay, uh, good night.